please take a look at page 73. This device can be used to measure the absolute pressure in any vessel. So this is a glass tube in the shape of the letter U and both sides are initially open to atmospheric pressure and we pour some liquid in could be mercury, could be another fluid. Now since both legs are open to atmosphere the same pressure, that means these liquid levels in the manometer will be equal, they'll level each other out. We're going to use this manometer and manometer just means a barometer a pressure measuring device. We're going to use this manometer to measure the pressure on some tank that we'll connect it to. This type of manometer is called a closed tube manometer. It measures absolute pressure of whatever it's connected to. Let me explain how it works. So after filling both legs with a liquid, which will be at the same level because the same pressure is acting on both sides, we use a stopcock and we close off one side, hence the name closed tube. Now closing the stopcock is not going to change the pressure of the gas, which by the way is measured by P1 here. Notice that the legs of the air column are the same on both sides, so the pressure must still be the same as atmospheric, otherwise they wouldn't be at the same level. Next we attach this right side to some tank. Let me just draw something to illustrate. Let's just say it's connected to something here that applies a pressure called Px. How can we calculate the magnitude of Px? Well look what happens when we connect it. Notice that the pressure in this tank must be greater than atmospheric pressure was because it's pushed the liquid down and the air column is forced down on the right side and it's compressed and forced the liquid column on the left side up compressing the gas in P2. Notice that Px must be greater than atmospheric pressure because it's pushed the gas down on the right side and pushed the liquid up compressing the gas so that P2 must be greater than P1. Remember in Boyle's law when you compress a gas you do so at higher pressure. We've compressed a gas from length 1 to length 2 so we must have compressed it with a higher pressure. How can we calculate that pressure? Well let's remember that the pressure of a gas is the same at virtually any height so the pressure of Px is also present here and here and here and here and all the way down to here. That's all the same pressure because it's just a gas. It has virtually no weight over short lengths. This pressure right here is Px, same as it is in the tank. Now recall the other rule is that pressure is equal at horizontal depths in the same fluid. Well this pressure here has to be the same as here because they're horizontal depths in the same fluid. So this is also Px right here. Now what is the pressure at Px? Well it's everything pushing down above it. It's this height of mercury, I'll say it's mercury, it's that many centimeters or inches of mercury. And by the way we attach a ruler to these so we can measure these heights. And then whatever pressure is in the gas at this point is also pushing down. Let me just write that down and then we'll go further with it. So I can say that Px is equal to so many inches or centimeters of mercury, I'll just call it H2 of, in this case, let's say it's mercury, plus the pressure of the gas, P2. Does that make sense? Everything pushing down to this point is the pressure that is registered at, P, at that point, Px. So P2 well, we don't know what it is, but we know that we started at P1 and it's increased to P2 by how much? Well, by the ratio by which the length has decreased. Remember in the syringe when we compress the gas, the pressure increases by the factor by which the gas was compressed. Now, I know in the syringe we talked about volumes, but we can use length in place of volumes because the cross-sectional area is constant in the tube and therefore length is proportional to area. If we half the area, we've half the length. If we half the volume, we half the length. So we can use length in place of volume. So I can say that P2 
is equal to the initial pressure P1 times some ratio of lengths that makes sense. Well, length 2 is smaller than length 1. We want to see the pressure get bigger. So make sure you put length 1, the longer length, over length 2, because length 1 is bigger than length 2, and that'll increase the pressure by that factor, and that'll be pressure 2. And we've got it. We've got the pressure at Px. Let's do an example. Bottom of page 73, sample problem. A closed tube mercury manometer, that's what we're using, is zeroed by opening both legs to atmosphere. Check. One leg is closed by means of a stopcock. That's right, on the left-hand side. The other leg, on the right-hand side, is connected to a tank used to store methane gas. Calculate the absolute pressure in atmospheres in the methane gas storage tank given the following manometer readings. Initial length is 30 centimeters of air. It's compressed to 20 centimeters of air. And the height, H2, is 15 centimeters. Unless otherwise stated, assume atmospheric is standard atmospheric pressure. So I've drawn it here. So initially, both liquid columns are at the same height because they're both open to atmospheric pressure. P A T M both sides. Then we close off the left hand side, trapping the length trapping the air in there. Length one, we're told is thirty centimeters. We have a ruler we can measure that. We then connect our tank, I'll just draw a little balloon here. We draw we connect the right hand side to some unknown pressure PX. Now that pressure in the tank is the same as it is here and here and here and here and all the way down to here because pressure is equal in a gas at any height over a reasonable length certainly over meters and and many meters it would be true so this is px right here and the pressure is equal at horizontal levels in the same fluid so that's px there what is the pressure at px well it's everything pushing down on it which includes 15 centimeters of mercury. Maybe you're wondering where that term was. That's the height of mercury above this point, plus whatever pressure is in here, P2, the pressure in the gas. Px is equal to 15 centimeters of mercury, plus whatever pressure is in the gas above it, P2. Now, we can figure out what P2 is. Right, P2 is equal to P1 times the ratio of lengths. The length of the column here, length 2, is 20 centimeters. So P2 is greater than P1 by this ratio. So make the ratio get bigger. We know that P1 initially was 1 atmosphere. We'll multiply by a ratio of lengths. This would be 30 centimeters length of air over 20 centimeters of air. Notice P2 is greater than P1 by this ratio, 30 over 20. This would be 1 atmosphere times 1.5, which is 1.5 atmospheres. That's the pressure of P2. It's greater than P1 by a factor of 1.5 times, because that's the ratio of the lengths of the air columns. Let me write this again. Px is equal to 15 centimeters of mercury. I'm going to convert that to atmospheres right now. How do I do that? One atmosphere for 76 centimeters of mercury plus P2, which we just determined is 1.5 atmospheres. Px is equal to now 15 divided by 76 is 0 0.2. 2.0 atmospheres plus 1.5 atmospheres so px the pressure in the tank is 1.7 atmospheres and that by the way is the absolute pressure it's the total pressure that's in that tank if we wanted to then calculate the gauge pressure in that tank if we used a gauge pressure gauge we would subtract atmospheric pressure that's PATM, 
and so the gauge pressure in that tank will be 0 0.7 atmospheres. And by the way, on a test, I will always ask you, whenever I can, the absolute and the gauge pressure in any system. So just keep that in mind. Does that make sense? Pressure in the tank. It's a gas. It's the same as the pressure all the way down right to the surface of the liquid. Well, the pressure at the surface of the liquid is also the pressure on the other side at the horizontal level. So that's still Px, same as over here in the tank. Now we can write the pressure at Px as everything pushing down upon it, which is the mercury, 15 centimeters, plus P2. So that gives us 15 centimeters plus P2. We can calculate P2 as a ratio of P1 times the lengths. And P1 was one atmosphere, so that's easy. The ratio of lengths, you know P2 has to be bigger than P1 because the gas is compressed by this ratio, 30 over 20. It's 1.5. Convert 15 centimeters to atmospheres as well. Combine them together, that's 1.7 atmospheres. It is the total pressure here, which is also the total pressure in the tank. Please take a look at page 74. I actually have the solution to the problem we did on the previous page. At the bottom of the page I have another problem. Here it's called extra problem. A closed tube mercury manometer is zeroed by opening both legs to atmosphere, right? One leg is closed by means of a stopcock. The other leg is connected to a tank used to store phosphoric acid. Calculate the absolute pressure to two sig figs in atmospheres and PSI in the acid storage tank given the following manometer readings. The initial length is 20 centimeters and then the final length, L2, is 30 centimeters. So it's increasing this time. And H2 is 10 centimeters. Unless otherwise stated, assume atmospheric pressure is at standard pressure. So I've drawn it and written it here. This is the initial condition. Both legs are open to atmospheric pressure here and here. That's why the liquid levels are equal. Then I close off one side and I connect it to a phosphoric acid storage tank. I'll just draw it like a balloon here. We'll call this Px. Now the initial length, it's to we're told L1, is 20 centimeters, but after we connect to the tank, we're told that L2 is 30 centimeters. So it's actually increased. The length of the air column has increased, and that's pushed or pulled, if you will, the liquid level up on the tank side, and this height is 10 centimeters of mercury. This is P1. And this is P2. So we have the opposite situation here. Px must be lower than atmospheric because atmospheric pressure has pushed the liquid up towards the phosphoric acid tank and the length of the column has increased from 20 to 30 centimeters. So P1 must be greater than P2. If the length of the column has increased then P2 must be less than P1. Right, so what can we say about pressures? Well, we can say the pressure in the tank is equal all the way down to here. That's Px. Where can we write an equation? We can write an equation where the pressures are equal, which is this horizontal line connecting the two liquids. Right? At this point, the pressure is equal. The pressure P2 is right here. That's equal to the pressure right here. That's P2 as well. Our equation would be something like this. We can say Px, which is all the way down to here, plus 10 centimeters of mercury. That pressure is what the total pressure is right here, That's e and that's P2, right? So if you compare this to the other equation, it looks quite different. I would advise you not to try and memorize the equations. Try and understand the problem because there's different equations for different situations. Does this make sense? The pressure in the tank, 
right down to here, plus this height of mercury is the total pressure at this point, which is equal to the pressure at this point, which is P2, and that's our basic equation. So what about P2? P2 will be equal to P1, which is one atmosphere pressure, times some ratio of lengths. Now notice that the length got longer, which means P2 must be smaller than P1 by this ratio. Let's make it get smaller. We'll put the smaller length, 20 centimeters, over the longer length, 30 centimeters. Again, I'm not trying to memorize L1 and L2. Just make sense of it. So 1 times 2 thirds has to be 0 0.667 atmospheres, and that is P2. Okay, let's write some stuff in here. I'm going to convert everything to atmospheres, and then we'll work from there. So Px, why don't I bring this to the right-hand side, equals, I'll say P2, which is 0 0.667 atmospheres, minus 10 centimeters of mercury. Does that make sense so far? Just rearranging. Now I want to convert this to atmospheres as well. So that would be one atmosphere over 76 centimeters of mercury. That should work. We have the pressure Px. Px is equal to 0 0.667 atmospheres minus 10 over 76 is 0 0.132 atmospheres. Px is equal to positive 0 0.5, I'm going to just round to two sig figs, atmospheres. That is the total pressure in the tank, Px, in atmospheres. That's the absolute pressure. Now we're told we want it in PSI as well. We can convert that. So that'll be 14.70 PSI is equal to one atmosphere, which is equal to seven 0.9 PSI. Now as I mentioned I'm always going to ask you for gauge pressure as well. So P gauge is just absolute minus atmospheric. If you subtract one atmosphere you'll get this to be minus 0.46 atmospheres. That's the gauge pressure. And if I subtract 14.7 PSI from here that'll give me negative 6.8 PSI. Why are the gauge pressures negative? Well, because the total pressures are less than one atmosphere. What do you think? The basic aim for you is to be able to write an equation where the pressure is equal on both sides of the column across a line that's horizontal. Then simply sum up the pressures that sit above those lines and make sure you include the term you're trying to solve for. In this case, I'm trying to solve for Px, so it's Px plus 10 centimeters of mercury is the pressure here, which is equal to the pressure here, which is P2. I don't know P2 directly, but I do know that it's P1, one atmosphere, times a ratio of lengths that makes sense. I can see P2 is less than P1 because the length of the column increase, so make that pressure get smaller. Use the ratio of 20 over 30. Take a look at page 75. In the problem so far, we've been assuming that atmospheric pressure is one atmosphere in our calculations, but what if it's not? Well, actually we can use this very same closed tube manometer to actually measure atmospheric pressure accurately. So the idea would be after you finish taking your measurements of the process, assuming one atmosphere pressure, the last reading would be to actually calculate atmospheric pressure exactly. And here's how that would be done. P atmospheric can be determined by adding more mercury after initially sealing one leg at atmospheric pressure. We start out as usual with both legs open to atmosphere and we close the left leg off we measure the height, L1 is 10.8 inches. Right side is open to atmosphere. We carefully pour some more mercury in. Make sure you do this outside in case you spill it. When you add more mercury, what happens? Well, the mercury level will rise on the right side, but guess what? It also rises on the left side because the increased pressure on the right compresses the gas on the left. Notice that L2 has been decreased by this amount. So here we have 
P atmospheric acting still. It's still open, but I'm showing that this is our unknown now. Instead of Px, it's just P atmospheric. If we could write an equation that describes the system and includes the unknown, we should be able to solve for it. What equation can we write? We can always write an equation to say that the pressure is equal at horizontal levels in the same fluid. You could work down here, that would work. You could also work up here. Choose whatever is easier. I think it's easier to work at the top. You might have fewer terms. So what can we say? I'll say the pressure on the right hand side, P atmospheric, plus this height of mercury. What would that be? Well it's 14.5 to here less 3.3. If I just stop here, 14.5 less 3.3 is 11.2 inches of mercury. I could go down to here, that works, but it gives me just more terms I don't need. I'll just stop here. I have a horizontal level right here. P atmospheric plus 11.2 inches of mercury is the pressure at this point, which is equal to the pressure at this point. And what is that? Well, it's everything pushing down, and that's equal to P2. That looks pretty easy. Now what is P2? Well P2 is equal to atmospheric pressure times some ratio. Is P2 greater than P1? Well sure it is because the length has decreased by the ratio of 10.8 divided by this length. What is this length by the way? Well it's 10.8 minus 3.3 so I'll say L2 would be 7.5 inches. So P2 is greater than P1 by this ratio. Let's write that in here. That's equal to P1. Now P1 is P atmospheric, but don't write in one atmosphere this time. We're trying to solve for P atmospheric. So leave it as a variable times the ratio of 10.8 inches, that's length, over 7.5 inches length. So that turns out to be 1.44. So P2 is actually 1.44 times atmospheric pressure. Do you follow that? All right. So here's atmospheric pressure. That's P1. P2 is greater than P1 by this ratio by which the lengths have changed 10.8 over 7.5. You know that P2 is bigger than P1, so put the big number over the small number. It's 1.44. Let me rewrite this. P atmospheric plus 11.2 inches of mercury is equal to 1.44 times P atmospheric. Let's collect our terms. I'll say 11.2 inches of mercury is equal to 1.44 P atmospheric minus P atmospheric. So I can say 11.2 inches of mercury is equal to 0 0.44 times P atmospheric therefore 11.2 inches of mercury divided by 0 0.44 is equal to P atmospheric. And What's that work out to be? It works out to be 25.5 inches of mercury. That's atmospheric pressure. Easily solved for if you can write an equation that includes that term. You'll notice that the lower part of this page we have the solution worked out but I'm asking you to do problem number four at the end of the chapter. Let's take a look at that. Page 82. So problem four is on page 82. Problem four says that air is trapped in a uniform closed tube manometer. That's the situation. The valve is closed. It's trapped sealed at one end by mercury. Well, I guess over here by mercury. Notice that the level of liquid is the same on both sides, which means that atmospheric pressure must be the same as pressure on the left. When the mercury levels in the two limbs are the same, the length of the air column is 42 centimeters. Sorry, this is a bit blurry. I'll try and make that a little more readable. L1 is 42 centimeters when more mercury is poured in, so the difference in the mercury levels is 50 centimeters, so here we have a difference in height of 50 centimeters. The length of the air column 
becomes 25 centimeters. So here's L2 is 25 centimeters. This is P2, this is P1, which is atmospheric pressure. Can we calculate atmospheric pressure from this? I think we can if we can write an equation that includes the term. This is P atmospheric. Okay. What can we write here? We can find a point, a horizontal level, where the pressure is equal, and that creates our basic equation. So we can write on the right hand side P atmospheric plus 50 centimeters of mercury. That would be the pressure right here. Everything above it is equal to the pressure over here, which is equal to P2. Right? Now what's P2? Well P2 is equal to P1, and P1 remember was atmospheric pressure, times some ratio of the change in lengths of the air column. Let's take a look. The air column was 42, and now it's reduced to 25. So where's the pressure greater? P2 is greater than P1 by the ratio of 42 over 25. This is 42 centimeters, and that's the length of an air column over 25 centimeters, length of an air column. 42 over 25 is 1.68 times. So this term here, P2, is actually, is actually equal to 1.68 times P atmospheric. So I can write 50 centimeters of mercury is equal to 1.68 times P atmospheric minus P atmospheric and therefore 50 centimeters of mercury is equal to 0 0.68 times P atmospheric and therefore P atmospheric is equal to 50 centimeters of mercury divided by 0 0.68 which is equal to 73.5 centimeters of mercury. That's it. Atmospheric pressure. 73.5 centimeters of mercury. It's not bad if you can just write an equation that includes the term you're trying to solve for. And the equation is usually just a case of finding a point in your manometer where the pressures are equal, then describe the pressure at each point, whatever is pushing down on top of it. On the right hand side it was atmospheric pressure plus 50 centimeters of mercury. It's equal to here which is P2. Now we know P2 is P1 times some ratio that makes sense to us. And P1 was initially one atmosphere. Not too, too bad. Take a look at page 76. Again we're using a U-shaped manometer but this time it's actually called a U-tube manometer. Or it's also called an open tube manometer. What's the difference? Well, we start out the same. We start with both legs open to atmosphere. Liquid levels are the same. But when we actually take the reading, we're going to leave the left leg open to atmosphere. So this will still be P atmospheric. So the pressure in the left hand side won't change. Even if the column length changes, it's still open to atmosphere. It's actually easier to calculate in this fashion by leaving the left leg open. It'll always be atmospheric pressure of gas on the left hand side. We connect the right side to some vessel, we'll call this PX. So the gas will enter and the pressure in the tank is the same as here and here and here. All the way down to here, this pressure is still PX. What else is true? We know that horizontal levels in the same fluid have the same pressure, so that pressure is the same over here. This is also PX. So PX is equal to everything above it. Let's write an equation for that. I'll say PX is equal to what? Well, it's equal to atmospheric pressure that's pushing down from the top, plus this height whatever it is, centimeters, inches of mercury, what happens to be. And that's that simple. Px is simply atmospheric plus that height of liquid. And that, again, will be the absolute or total or true pressure in X. What would be the gauge pressure here? Well, the gauge pressure always is simply the absolute pressure minus P atmospheric. Right? Well, if you think about it, if the pressure here, the total pressure, is atmospheric 
plus this height. What's the gauge pressure? Well, it's the total pressure minus atmospheric. So the gauge pressure is just this here. When you use the manometer in an open fashion as an open U2 manometer, the height difference is the gauge pressure. The sum of the gauge plus one atmosphere is the absolute pressure. This system is actually easier to use than having it closed. The only danger here is that if the pressure in the tank is too high, it can blow the liquid right out. It wouldn't happen in the other case because in a closed tube manometer, this is sealed off and you can only compress the gas. You wouldn't blow it out. You might blow up the glass if you have enough pressure, but that would take a very high pressure to do so. So in an open tube U-tube manometer, the height difference turns out to be the gauge pressure. The sum of the height plus atmospheric is the absolute pressure. We can do problems 5 and 6 to get some practice with this. Please take a look at page 83. Number five, pressure is applied to one limb of a mercury-filled U-tube manometer. U-tube implies open tube. The level of the open limb is 10 inches higher. Calculate the gauge pressure in PSI. Calculate the absolute pressure. Right, so because it's an open tube manometer, the difference in pressure between atmosphere and the tank is this distance, it's 10 inches of mercury. That is the gauge pressure. P gauge is 10 inches of mercury. If we want that in PSI, we'll just convert it 14.7 PSI over 29.9 inches of mercury that's 4.92 psi. That's the gauge pressure. If we want the absolute pressure, we'd simply add atmospheric pressure to that, which is 14.70 psi. That's P atmospheric. This is P gauge. The sum is P absolute. And that's 19.6 psi absolute. That's one way to do it. Very simple. Nevertheless, if that's not clear to you, let's go through the foolproof method that always works. We can write an equation where the pressure is equal. Where's the pressure equal here? It's equal here. At this point, equal levels in the same horizontal fluid. So let's say the pressure here in the tank is Px, the actual pressure, the absolute pressure is Px. It's the same here and here and here. All the way down to this point, that is Px. And that's the same pressure as over here, which is also Px. What is the pressure above this point? It's 10 inches of mercury plus atmospheric pressure. We can write an equation and say that Px, which is the total pressure, is equal to 10 inches of mercury plus P atmospheric. Now, P atmospheric, we can assume the value is 29.9 inches of mercury, standard value, and therefore Px, which is the total pressure, is 39.9 inches of mercury. And if we want to convert that to PSI, we multiply by 14.7 PSI for 29.9 inches of mercury. And we'll come up with 19.6 PSI absolute. Then if we want to know the gauge pressure, we would subtract 14.7 PSI, which is atmospheric pressure, and we'll come up with 4.92 PSI gauge. So that works too. If this makes more sense to you, find the level where the pressure is equal, write an equation, it always works. We can simply say to yourself, well look, the, the difference in pressure between the tank and atmospheric pressure is that much difference. Right? If they were the same, the levels would be the same, but they're different by 10 inches. The difference in pressure from atmospheric is 10 inches. And you can see that in the tank it's 10 inches greater than atmospheric. That's the gauge pressure. Let's take a look at number six. 
Number six says if one leg of a mercury filled U2 manometer is subjected to a pressure of 8.99 psi and the other leg to a pressure of 6 psi, calculate the difference in height of the two columns expressed in the answer in inches of mercury. In this case neither side is connected to atmosphere but the difference in height of the columns indicates the difference in pressure between the two. If the pressure was the same on both sides then there'd be no difference in height of the columns. The difference in height is the result of the difference in pressure. The difference in pressure, which is equal to the difference in height, is equal to 8.99 minus 6.00, that's PSI, the difference is 2.99 PSI. What is the height then in inches of mercury? Simply convert that to inches of mercury. There's 29.92 inches of mercury for every 14.70 PSI. Delta P works out to be 6.08 inches of mercury is the difference in height of these two columns. Pretty straightforward, eh? Please take a look at page 77. This is an incline manometer. Uh, they're similar to YouTube manometers when one side is left open to the atmosphere but there are two differences there's a relatively large reservoir of fluid that ensures the level of the reservoir won't really raise or fall when for small changes in the other side and then by pulling one leg over at a steep angle one can measure the diagonal of the difference in height rather than the vertical and then calculate the vertical height from the diagonal more accurately. So again the difference in height is measured but we're going to measure it here on the diagonal and then we'll calculate the vertical height. How do we do that? We need to know the angle and that's generally given or can be measured on this type of incline manometer. We'll just say that's theta, the angle theta. We'll measure the length of the hypotenuse r and let's say this is the vertical y and x. So if we take the sine of the angle theta, it's the opposite over the hypotenuse which would be y over r and we want to calculate y so y is equal to r times the sine of theta. So really it's no different than measuring the actual height but we measure the diagonal instead and calculate the actual height. So to do this you need to make sure that your calculator is in the degrees mode. At the bottom of the page I have some instructions here. Students note make sure your calculator is in the degrees mode not radians or gradients. To change angular modes on the sharp series calculators press second function degree repeatedly until the display reads degrees and then it's a good idea to check it if you know the sign of a couple of angles you could check that it correct I don't know if you recall but the sign of 90 is 1 so type it in sign 90 if you get 1 you're in good shape or cos of 90 is 0 as a check and you're ready to do the problems Here's an image of an actual incline manometer. Often they're used for small pressure differences because the incline exaggerates the reading. We calculate the vertical. Many times they're filled with water or a light oil. They can be filled with mercury but they're usually used with light oils. Notice these top fittings can be tightened and closed so it doesn't spill when you want to put it away. Then you simply open them up and you can connect either side to what you want to measure the pressure of. The other side can go to atmosphere or any application thereof. 
problem numbers 7 through 13. Well, let's get started. Go to page 84. We have an incline manometer. Problem number 7 says if the barometric pressure is 14.70 psi, then the barometric pressure is atmospheric pressure. That's the term used to describe it. Determine the absolute and gauge pressure in psi indicated by the inclined manometer. So this 14.7 psi would be acting here because this side is connected to some vacuum. This will be the unknown pressure we're trying to solve for. So what's the difference between them? Well they're not the same because the difference in heights of the liquids aren't the same. They differ by by about this height. So what's that difference? Well we can calculate it using the length of the hypotenuse. Here's our length of the hypotenuse. We're gonna we're given as five inches and we'll calculate this height. Y equals R times the sine of theta. Now Y here represents the difference in height which is the difference in pressure. R, the hypotenuse, is 5.0 inches, and that's inches of mercury. And we have the sine of theta. Theta is given as 30 degrees. The sine of 30 degrees is 0 0.5. So the difference in height is 2.5 inches of mercury. Now notice, looking at the diagram, is the pressure on the left side greater than atmospheric or less? Well, it's actually less because atmospheric pressure is pushing the liquid down on the right and lifting it on the left. So this difference in pressure actually must be less than atmospheric. What I've just calculated is 2.5 inches of mercury vacuum. The gauge pressure on the left hand side would actually be minus 2.5 inches of mercury vacuum because it's less than atmospheric by that much. I want to convert that to PSI. Multiply by 14.70 PSI, standard atmospheric pressure, divided by 29.92 inches of mercury, standard atmospheric pressure. Uh, 15 over 30 is about a half, and this actually works out to be minus 1.23 PSI and that's the gauge pressure. So we're asked also to calculate the absolute pressure. This is gauge. If we add atmospheric to it, we'll come up with absolute, because absolute is the sum of the two, right? All right, so atmospheric pressure is 14.70 psi, and we add those together, we get 13.47 PSI, and that's absolute. So we're saying that the absolute pressure on the left hand side is less than atmospheric by 1.23 PSI, and so what's left on the left hand side is 13.47 PSI. All right, number eight says an inclined manometer used to measure the difference in air pressure in a pipe, here's our pipe, between two points. Notice neither of these is necessarily atmospheric, we just want to measure the difference in pressure. A difference in pressure would be indicated by a difference in height. If these were the same pressure, then the height would be the same. If the manometer fluid is an oil with a specific gravity of 0.827, what pressure difference in PSI is indicated by the manometer? Well, again, the pressure difference is simply this height. Let's calculate the height, and then we'll figure out how to convert that height of oil into PSI. So the difference in height is this. How are we going to calculate it? We've measured the hypotenuse here. 
which is two inches. And we want, I'll call this y and r. So y is equal to r times the sine of the angle. And the angle here is given to be 20 degrees. So that's going to be 2 inches times the sine of theta, the sine of 20 degrees. And that's 2 times 0 0.342. And that works out to be 0 0.684 inches of height of oil. And that's why we use an inclined manometer. That's a really small height to try and measure accurately. We can do a little better by measuring the hypotenuse. The steeper the angle, the larger will be the hypotenuse for a given height of oil. So the difference in pressure is 0.684 inches of oil. Delta P equals 0 0.684 inches of oil. We want to convert that to PSI. Now we don't know the standard height of oil that equals an atmosphere pressure, but we could convert this from inches of oil to inches of a standard substance like mercury. Usually that's done. We'll multiply by a ratio of specific gravities that makes sense. Now let's think what makes sense if you put mercury in this manometer instead of oil, would the height be larger or smaller? Please say smaller. Mercury is much denser, so it would be a very small difference in height for that small pressure. So we have to make this number get smaller, so we're going to use the density of the oil, or specific gravity of the oil in this case, 0 0.827. I'm going to write that's the specific gravity of the oil. Divided by 13.596 is the specific gravity of mercury. Notice again how the units do not cancel. These are not direct relationships. This is an inverse relationship. The denser the fluid, the smaller will be the height of it for the same pressure. So you have to use a logical approach, which is what we're doing here. We say mercury is denser, we'll get less of it, make the number get smaller, put the small number over the big number. This works out to be 0 0.0416 inches, and now it's inches of mercury. Can we convert that to PSI? Sure, because mercury is a standard substance, we know that 14.70 PSI, which is standard pressure, is equivalent to 29.92 inches of mercury. When you work that out, that's 0 0.020 PSI. Boy, that's a small pressure. And that's a typical application for an incline manometer using a light fluid like an oil at a steep incline. And we can measure it reasonably well in that fashion. So this is the difference in pressure between these two points. We can't really say if one's atmospheric or gauge. We just know the difference in pressure is what's shown because we have no indication of atmospheric pressure in this problem. So that brings us to the end of the various types of pressure measuring instruments we'll learn about in this unit. There are some other problems that follow, and I'll create a separate video for that or take some of those up live with you in class. It's really important that you learn how to calculate the problems that follow. Uh, take a look at them. Don't pass out. They're a lot easier than you might think. I'll walk you through them. I want to just go back to the notes for a second. It brings us to page 78. You'll see on page 78 there's one final version of a manometer called a bifluid manometer where we have two liquids in it, two different liquids. But I've decided some years ago to delay this and I cover it much later toward the end of the flow unit where it'll make more sense to you. I found students had an awfully hard time of it at this point but later on in the course it's quite easy to use as you'll see. So I'm going to leave bifluid manometers out for now. On page 79 we'll finish our theory on pressure measurement. There are several mechanical types of pressure gauges We've already studied the Borden tube pressure gauge in our study of thermometry. Notice that the, recall that the Borden tube, the C-shaped tube, will expand or open up on high pressure and 
coil up a bit on low pressure causing a movement on a gauge. The gauge could be calibrated in terms of temperature if temperature is causing the pressure change or you could have it calibrated in terms of pressure. So that's a Borden tube pressure gauge. Here is something called a bellows type pressure gauge. A bellows is a flexible chamber which will expand or contract with changing pressure. So here is a bellows that's used to stoke up a fire. You open and squeeze this together to blow air into it. Here is an accordion that before the age of electronics air was pumped through the system by the accordion player opening and closing the bellows as he played the keys. So a bellows is a corrugated hollow chamber that can expand and contract under pressure or vacuum. So here if the pressure at the inlet increases on our gauge that will cause the bellows to expand and the motion would move the index or needle on the pressure gauge. If on the other hand the pressure were to reduce then the bellows would contract again causing a motion on the dial indicating a pressure gauge. Bellows tend to be more sensitive than board and tubes. They're typically used for low pressures. They can also measure vacuum. And finally on page 80 we have a diaphragm type pressure gauge. So a diaphragm is a thin flexible membrane that can dimple in either direction under pressure or vacuum. So on the top side of this thin diaphragm is a fixed container of gas so its pressure is constant and then the other end is connected to the air or whatever you want to measure the pressure or vacuum of. So if the pressure on the bottom side was greater than the top side of the diaphragm, the diaphragm would dimple upwards causing a motion on our index uh, giving us a pressure reading. On the other hand if a lower pressure was felt below the diaphragm it would cause the diaphragm to pucker downwards again causing a motion on the index and on the scale. Diaphragm gauges are used as household aneroid barometers. So have you ever seen an aneroid barometer? They're still used as decorative pieces on a wall or a mantelpiece. And notice here's a aneroid barometer showing the flexible diaphragm contained within the housing. And that's about all we need for the theory on this unit on pressure. There are some problems for you to complete. Problems 9 through 13, which are found on page 84 and 85 and 86. Some of them may look difficult, but we'll take them apart and show you how easy they actually are to solve using our logic system of horizontal levels of the same fluid have the same pressure. We'll break it down from there. All right, so that'll be on the next video, our last video on this unit.